Hi, this is Ryan from The Thing You're Currently Watching. Please enjoy this pitch meeting for Spider-Man Homecoming, the one where he, he comes home. And then stick around after because I'll talk about things and it. While you're doing that, I'm gonna draw MJ. So what's the movie about? Well, it takes place a couple of months after Civil War. Okay, so Tony Stark has just made a big deal about superheroes having to be responsible. Exactly. So at the beginning of this movie, Tony leaves a weaponized spider suit with a high school student and then doesn't take his calls. Oh, very cool. Yeah, and it's equipped with a ton of crazy stuff. There's a bunch of web modes, a recon drone, glider wings, web grenades, even an instant kill mode that kind of turns on by itself. And Tony just leaves that in the hands of a teenager. Well, he left a software block on the crazier stuff. Oh, so it's impossible for Peter to access those modes. Actually super easy, barely an inconvenience. Really? Yeah, well, Peter's friend Ned from high school hacks into the suit and just unblocks everything. Oh, hacking. They also take a tracker out so Tony and Happy can't see where he goes. So Stark Technology's like the best in the world. This Ned guy must be really smart. Eh. He's not. I mean, I guess technically he is, but we're gonna play him as really dumb. Oh, interesting. Yeah, like in the first part of the movie, he keeps loudly asking Peter super sensitive questions. Oh, that's dumb. Yeah, you'd think that would be a no-brainer for anyone, right? And he's able to hack Stark Tech. He is, so Peter has access to a bunch of functionalities. Interesting. Yeah, and it was really fun to write, because whenever I didn't know how to solve a problem in a scene, I was like, oh, well maybe the Stark suit has a mode to solve this. That's smart. Yeah, and when that didn't work, I'd just have Iron Man swoop in and save the day. Hey, people like Iron Man. They do. Oh, that reminds me, the suit has a Jarvis interface, so we might have to get Paul Bettany back if possible. Oh, actually, we can't do that. How come? Well, he's transformed into Vision now. Oh, that's right. I can see if his wife is available. Jennifer Connelly, yeah, perfect. Great. So does this movie have a villain? Because I'd like to start casting ASAP. It does. He's called the Vulture. The Vulture. So kind of like a... He's like a bird man. A bird man. Okay. I can work with that, that'll help. Awesome. So what's his deal? Well, he was hired to clean up alien debris after the invasion in the first Avengers movie. Interesting, tying it together. Yeah, but then he was fired, so he became a supervillain to support his family. Just a 180 like that. Yeah, pretty much immediately. So he and his crew start stealing alien debris and use them to make super weapons. Oh, you'd think the government would be keeping really close watch on that stuff. You'd think so, but we jump forward eight years in time and Vulture's doing great, no problems at all. Wow. Yeah, and it's like they're not even being that secretive about it. No. No, they're just selling to like run-of-the-mill criminals for robberies and stuff. Just anyone. It seems that way. Plus one of the guys likes to demo them in open spaces. At another point, they're literally on the news. And nobody's looking too deeply into this. Not really, no, but Spider-Man decides to. Oh, he does, does he? Yeah, and it's gonna lead to some pretty crazy action. Like we're really stepping things up from the older Spider-Man movies. I'm listening. So you know in the Amazing Spider-Man 2, there's Peter's love interest falling from high up inside a tower? Yeah. Well, in this movie, we're gonna have Peter's love interest falling from high up inside a tower, except now that tower is the Washington Monument. Mmm, what's wrong? I think that's a mistake. It is? Yeah, I do. I think the Washington Monument is technically an obelisk, not a tower. Oh, but you like the idea. Oh yeah, no, I love the idea. Love interest falling from high up, that's amazing. Great. And we're also gonna do the Jesus thing from Spider-Man 2. Jesus thing? You know when Tobey Maguire is trying to stop a train with some webs and it looks like he's gonna poop? Oh yeah. Yeah, so basically that, but with a fairy that gets cut in half. How does he manage to get the fairy back together? Well, I couldn't think of a way for the suit to take care of it, so Iron Man swoops in and saves the day. Gotcha, that's a good system, right? It made this so easy to write. So what's the climax of the movie? Oh, so Happy Hogan is having a bunch of super dangerous and valuable stuff shipped for Tony. He does that even though there's this big bad guy flying around stealing dangerous and valuable stuff? Yes, he does. So I guess he's gonna have some pretty crazy security on that shipment. No, he puts it on a plane and sets the plane to autopilot. That's it? Oh, it's invisible. Does that help? No. How did the Vulture and his team learn so much about the plans to ship this stuff? Oh, we're not gonna explain that. Oh, that's a gutsy move, cause some people might consider that lazy writing, but I know you're just trying to keep some mystery, I like it. Yes, because of the mystery, that's why. I did that. And how does the movie end? Well, Tony had taken Peter's suit away because he went after the Vulture, which was reckless. Right. And at the end, he offers him a new suit because he went after the Vulture, which was brave. Okay, so Spider-Man ends the movie with an even better suit. Actually, no, that's a pretty big moment. Go on. Tony offers him this amazing Iron Spider suit, but he's like, no thanks. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's a huge character moment. I like that. Right, it sends the message of like, I don't need Iron Man. Exactly, by not taking the suit, it's like, I am my own person. Yeah, and I think the decision to not get in the suit is really going to define the character moving forward. I love it. There you go, the one and only MJ. Hard to miss with that classic red hair. So listen, Debris. 
Debris. Here's a little fun tidbit I learned in the comment section of that video. It's pronounced debris. I don't know why I thought that S was a Z sound, but I did. Another lesson learned is that if you make a mistake, people will point it out, and that's kinda good for engagement. Half that comment section was hurting my feelings that day. So other than my personal struggles, this pitch meaning, man, it that, that, that first line, so what's the movie about? That's way too harsh of a first line. I didn't know that back then, but you gotta ease people in with us, so you got a movie for me. This was the fifth pitch meeting I ever made, and I guess this was a thing where I called things lazy. I didn't even realize I was doing that so much. I think in like three of the first five pitch meetings, I said that things were lazy, and that's just not very kind or polite. Also, I was really leaning into the swooping images with the swish sound effect on this one. Mentioning Paul Bettany and then swooping in a glamour shot of him way younger, that was a choice. And then seconds later, swooping in a picture of him and his wife Jennifer Connelly at some event. I think that my thinking was probably, hey, let's make sure as many people understand what I'm talking about as possible. But over the years, I'd say that's become much less of a concern. If you get it, you get it. If you don't, you don't. Similarly, over 30 seconds of this like four and a half minute video is spent explaining Meaning that Ned is dumb but also smart. Uh, that didn't have to be that long. You guys, I'm sure, got it pretty quickly. I do like the Birdman joke still. I think, like, I like that that I leave you to fill in the blank in your mind. The way I was writing these early ones back then, that could have easily been, oh, what about Michael Keaton? And then I swoop in a picture of Michael Keaton. No, oh, what about Michael Keaton from Birdman? Since you said Birdman, I thought about Michael Keaton from the movie Birdman. That is the connection I've made with the information you've given me. Also, just in general, I think there are a lot more points I could have covered in this pitch meeting. Peter's vlogging a lot in this movie, which sounds like a note a Hollywood producer would give to relate to the youth. Also, Peter's spidey sense doesn't really seem to work very much. His suit being full of Stark tech kind of takes away from the idea that Peter Parker's a genius too. So okay-ish pitch meeting, considering I didn't really know what I was doing yet. But I think I could have done some things better, which leads me into the rewriting section of the video. P pointing. All right, so here we are with the Google docking portion where we Google doc together. Well, I'll do it. You, you you watch. So something I didn't mention in this pitch meeting that in retrospect is so hilarious that Marvel did this. The title of this movie is so petty. It's easy to forget because this was like eight years ago, but a major reason they called it Spider-Man Homecoming was because Spider-Man was coming back into the MCU after being owned by Sony for so long. It's such a petty title. So I would mention that in the pitch meeting. So obviously today I would start with a, so you have a Spider-Man movie for me. And then I'd be like, yes, sir, I do. And I was thinking we call it Spider-Man Homecoming. Oh, how come? Well, you know, I just think it sends a message to Sony. What's the message? And then, you know, I've mentioned in the past, I like unexpected bleeping. Uh, that kind of seems like it comes out of nowhere. So in this case, I would leave a long pause. <laughs> you. An alternate version could be like, <laughs> you, I win, something like that. Something I think I would change is this whole thing of um, writer guy saying that he just has Iron Man swoop in and save the day. That actually feels like it could be a producer guy note. And that way I could easily cover the thing I mentioned about Peter not solving problems himself too much. So this line here, and when that didn't work, I just have Iron Man swoop in and save the day. I'd get rid of that. But other than that, Spider-Man's obviously gonna use his genius brain to get out of sticky situations. Or maybe Iron Man could save him a bunch. Oh, well, I feel like we're gonna want Spider-Man to do some of the work. That next line works. People like Iron Man, but people like Iron Man. I think that's kind of funny, just doubling down without even letting writer guy get a uh, word in. And so that kind of covers the point I was trying to make, and it hints that initially maybe there was a version where Iron Man wasn't so life-saving. I, I understand it's like a theme of the movie that he's kind of like this fathery figure to Spider-Man, but still, there was a lot of him swooping in to save the day or his technology saving the day. It was like, yeah, Spider-Man's in the MCU now, which I guess means that Iron Man's gonna be there all the time because people like Iron Man. Then if you look at this, this entire section and even a bit below is the Washington Monument joke. Two things happen in that whole block of text. I identify that uh, there's another love interest falling scene like in a previous movie and that the Washington Monument technically isn't a tower. Although I do kind of like this moment here where it seems like producer guy is gonna push for something more original than redoing a love interest falling scene. And then you just find out he's talking about the obelisk thing. For the sake of Google docking, we could kind of tighten this up and change the perspective a bit. Yeah, and it's gonna lead to some crazy action, like Peter's love interest is gonna fall from the Washington Monument and he has to save her. Didn't they kind of already do a tower fall in The Amazing Spider-Man 2? Uh, technically, the Washington Monument isn't a tower, it's an obelisk. Oh, well, that's completely different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And hey, early pitch meeting, nothing was tight. Uh, phallic monuments are 
tight. So there you go, a couple of examples of things I might change if I had written this today. Okay, question time. Ryan, I am dying. Oh no. To know. Oh, okay. How did you get Murr from Impractical Jokers in a pitch meeting? Murr and I had connected, I think on Twitter or Instagram a little while before that. Kind of strangely, this sounds made up, but it's absolutely not. I was watching Impractical Jokers on TV when I first got a message from Murr saying that he enjoyed pitch meetings. So we got to talking a little bit and then I was like, oh, Joker, Joker. That's the same name as their show, kind of. And that's how that happened. Good dude, good dude. Question, if you hired an editor, thumbnail designer, and anything else you do, how many pitch meetings do you think you could hypothetically get out every week? Hypothetically, a couple. But the, the longest thing about pitch meeting is the writing, and then the second longest thing is the editing, which really, it's only just a couple of hours. And I wouldn't want to outsource either of them because those are the comedy. That's where it comes from. Majority part of it is the writing, but a non-negligible part of it comes from the editing because timing is important in comedy. So to outsource comedic timing, I feel like I'd have to give a bunch of notes and it's only a couple of hours, so, so yeah. My question to you, Ryan, if I encounter you in Montreal, is it weird if I want to buy you a coffee or a drink to show appreciation? I would say it wouldn't be weird if we were in a coffee shop or a bar, but I pro like I wouldn't follow a stranger to a second location because I've seen movies. Liam Neeson's not going to come save me, so... I gotta look out for myself. Where do we comment in order to possibly be in the Q&A section of these videos? That you found it. Okay, bye. See you next time.